Well, it looks like the number of participants logging in is starting to level off. So I just like to say good afternoon now, everybody, and thank you for joining us for the third of four webinars during the 37th annual Kempville Winter Woodlot Conference. My name is Olivia, and I'm the Communications Coordinator for the Ontario Woodlot Association, and I'll be moderating today's session. I'd first like to say thank you to the sponsors of the conference, who you can see on the screen, as well as to the committee who has organized what continues to be an excellent series with diverse and knowledgeable speakers across Ontario. Um, I'll also add that the Kempville Winter Woodlot Conference is a longtime legacy of the Eastern Ontario Model Forest a not-for-profit charitable organization that works to develop new ways to, to sustain and manage our forest resources across Ontario, alongside landowners, First Nations, NGOs, government, and industry. Alongside the model forest, the Ontario Woodlot Association is a not-for-profit organization with the goals and aims to advocate for um, sustainable forestry practices and um, support private landowners. So before we get started, I'll just go over a couple of housekeeping items, similar as the other series of the Kempville Winter Woodlock Conference. This presentation is being recorded um, and all attendees, cameras and microphones are muted with the exception of the panelists. We encourage you to type questions into the Q&A box throughout the presentation. Um, and in order to make the Q&A session as accessible as possible to everyone, we'll invite folks um, who've clicked the uh, the raise hand button to speak if time allows during that Q&A session. Um, so now I'll pass the baton over to Martin Strait, representing the planning committee to introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Olivia. I'll be brief. Uh, just welcome everybody on behalf of SDNG chapter of the OWA. So our president, Dorothy Hamilton, and me and Jim Hendry are uh, Basically, we are the committee. So uh, I hope you're all enjoying what you've seen so far. And uh, I know we're gonna have another great talk today. And with that, I'll introduce uh, someone who's known to most of us actually, Ken Elliott. In fact, Ken was a speaker for us last year. He gave a, a wonderful talk on songbirds and forests. And this year he's gonna talk on a, another topic for us. Uh, Ken is a longtime MNR employee, retired last year, um, still very active, works for uh, Fraser Smith Consulting also is uh, still an active member of the Ontario Tree Marking Program. So any of you who have been through the Ontario Tree Marking course know Ken as well. Um, long time interest in forests. This year though, we're, uh, we're getting him engaged, not just today, but in another couple of occasions, starting to talk about the newest forest pest that uh, many of us landowners have to worry about. And that is the Hemlock Woolly Adelgid. So Ken, if you're uh, ready to go, I'll turn it over to you and thank you. I see that you're muted there, Ken. I'll just go ahead and unmute you. Mute. Okay. There you go. Yeah. You can hear me now? Yes. Okay. But I'm going to, okay. I'm just going to hold on a sec there. Oh, okay. Now, now it's good for me. It's still good for you? Uh, we don't have your slide up just yet. Okay. I didn't change anything. Okay, maybe if um, if you're able to stop sharing and reshare, that usually does the trick. Yeah, it won't let me. Uh, it will oh, I, try I, try it again. Try what? <laughs> we were uh, we we're playing around with the settings before the webinar started, so just uh, try resharing now. It should work. Yeah, it's just that it's. I'm gonna have to end my show then. Yeah. Okay. And uh, let's see here, go to share. Yep, there we go. Share that. Great, yeah. Can you see it now? Yeah, it's just on uh, PowerPoint uh, slideshow mode. You'll just have to. Right, okay, so presenter. Oh, there we go. Sorry, everyone. There we go. Sometimes these things happen. Um, and that. Uh, Thank you for the introduction, Martin. And I just want to uh, welcome everyone and uh, tell you a little bit about 
I, a little footnote about expertise. So, uh, um, you know, it was around 19, uh, 1920. Yeah, it was around 2020, uh, still working for MNR. And, you know, there was a lot of discussion about uh, this hemlock woolly adelgid and the fact that it, it had started to show up in Ontario. It had, you know, been doing some damage in Nova Scotia. And people were starting to ask questions about what are we going to do in Ontario? And the one of the messages that we were hearing was that there was uh, some interest in, in the possibility that uh, doing uh, some active management in our hemlock stands may help the hemlock be better prepared for this insect. So, uh, but at the time, we really didn't have uh, much in the way of any kind of information for people that was specific to Ontario. So uh, the folks from CFS, so I'm going to mention some of these names, uh, Chris McQuarrie, Victoria Derry, uh, science folks at uh, the Canadian Forest Service. Uh, they started talking to us about the kind of requests they were getting. They were working in Nova Scotia with the folks there. And um, it sort of became clear that we needed some information some products to help people and uh you know who's going to help uh, build these things and uh i remember them coming to me and saying well ken what do you know about this and i'm like well i know a little bit about silviculture not too much about hemlock uh not too much about hemlock woolly adelgid but i'm willing to help right so that was on the team as soon as they said that last phrase there i was willing to help so uh um bill parker scientist with ofri he kind of led the science part of this. Uh, again, he had a little bit of experience with hemlock, a lot of experience with, uh, you know, managing and considering the things that conifer forests need, things like crown closure, light. Uh, he's a physiologist. He's quite an expert, a uh, long-term friend of mine um, in the business of uh, understanding how forests grow and, you know, responses to silviculture. So we got Bill involved, Sharon Reed, who's our, uh, forest health scientist with uh, with Ofri in the Sioux with MNR and and Mike Brianessi, an MNR folk that uh, you might know who's been involved with our guys. So that was a group that was put together to kind of start to wrestle down some products. And the first product, and I, and at the end of the talk, you're going to hear about the uh, the information that's out there was a uh, a science paper that was published in the Forestry Chronicle just this last year. And it talks about, you know, the biology of the insect, the hemlock woolly adelgid, the biology of hemlock, the history around, you know, different aspects of hemlock management, and, and really tried to wrestle to the point where, how do those two things meet? Silviculture of hemlock and uh, the, uh, the, the way the insect operates and uh, provided some guidance there. And then the next thing that we needed was some sort of a fact sheet based on that. And that's really what this talk is about today. There's a fact sheet out that MNR put out, Bill led that as well. And uh, um, so that's available. And then they also, uh, the folks at, this, at uh, the Forest Service have, have uh, produced a, uh, I'm not sure if it's 100% uh, published yet, but it's gonna be a live, uh, management guide that's going to be on the uh, Invasive Species Center webpage that people can refer to. It's going to get uh, updated regularly. So that's sort of the background behind this. And uh, I just wanted to point out the fact that it's this team approach that's really needed for new things like this to come along. It, you know, we don't have a lot of experience with this insect because it's brand new. Uh, and hemlock as a species from the forestry side it has always been something we've we're all we all love hemlock it's probably for a lot of us one of our favorite species but it it tends to have been in the uh iconic world of uh you know old growth and uh and wildlife habitat and special areas you think of uh deep dark forests uh riparian zones um and a lot of species that really, um, you know, rely on it in that realm. And yet when it came to forestry, a lot of us that have been involved with it, you know, you'd see a hemlock, you'd see a little pocket of hemlock, you're doing some tree marking. And generally speaking, we've kind of just left it alone because of all these other factors. And maybe the final part being that uh, it hasn't 
traditionally had a lot of markets and hasn't been sought out as a, you know, a wood product so much as uh, some of our other species. So, so for all those reasons, maybe we're a little behind on silviculture for hemlock, but uh, now's the time to get back in the game here. So uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. So again, I want to thank Bill for, he, he put a lot of this presentation together and he's given this before. So I'm sort of using his, some of his slides. I built a few of my own. I got some help from Glenn Prevo, who's in the panel there. So uh, he gave me some help on the, the uh, discussion about insecticides. So uh, we'll get to that. Let's go to the first slide here. So the occurrence, you know, this is a foundational uh, tree species in Ontario and um, the diagram uh, is like a heat map. So the, the it's the range of hemlock in Ontario. The hotter, the red, the red, the yellows, the oranges, the hotter colors are where it's the highest densities or hemlock are, are, are found in Ontario. And um, so you can see it's got a it's got a fairly big range, and it's an important component of our of our tall and hardwood forests. Uh, sometimes they're mixed. It's mixed wood conifer forest that it's in. It's uh, as I say, it's 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 uh, it's specialized to uh, creating habitats that are uh, deep dark, cool forests in the summer. If you if you've been out, you know when you see that hemlock, you can walk into there and it feels like the temperature has dropped a few degrees just when you get into there. It's so shady. Um, you know, it's a specialized habitats. You think of uh, these riparian areas, uh, these, uh, you know, protecting streams. So these are, you know, these are the types of places you think of with, with hemlock. There are species of birds and mammals that um, are dependent on, on, on hem hemlock as critical habitat. And as you know, recreationists, um, indigenous communities, uh, and just people in general that that like the forest. If you mention the word hemlock, usually people's eyes light up and they they think of it as being a special tree and a special species in our in our woodlands and our ecosystems. And there are some there are some unique products that that the, that the hemlock's been used for. Uh, apparently, you know, in some a lot of barns, the the timbers that uh, that the main timbers holding those barns up are often hemlock. Uh, it's used to, you know, it's somewhat resistant to to rot, so it's been used in in fencing and for posts and things like that, and and other things too that I probably don't even know about. But it's been limited. There's not been a lot of uh, commercial uh, usages for hemlock over the years. Uh, the bark, you have to remember the bark. The bark was used uh, with indigenous uh, communities and in in the tanning, the the uh, leather tanning industry historically. Um, so what's going on with this uh, this this insect, this adelgid? Uh, it's it's actually been around for quite a while. Um, so this map, just to explain the map, uh, it's the gray is the range of hemlock again, and the coloring is um, where the adelgid's been found. So within the within the range, right? So um, you know started. Back in the 50s, it was accidentally introduced uh, on ornamental uh, stock coming from Japan. Um, we first discovered in the, the Virginia area, Richmond, Virginia. Um, you know, soon, once it was kind of identified and they started tracking it, they were finding that it was moving about 12 kilometers uh, per year, which is quite a ways uh, when, you, when you think about it. Um, winter temperatures are, are something that, that can hold it back. And I don't know for sure whether this diagram would be an indication of climate change, but that is one of the, the problems is that as our climate warms, uh, the potential for it to move uh, as on that track, mostly a northerly, northerly track, um, it, it's quite possible that this is kind of showing that. Um, so it can move around 100 meters or a few hundred meters uh, with things like rain and wind and animals and, and on humans. But it's the, the it's the actual 
the long, those longer distances, those 12 kilometer distances that we're worried about, the long distance transport. Um, so uh, birds can be responsible for this. So you, last year I talked about birds. Well, birds in this case are bad. They can, you know, the, there's a stage when the, the insect can get on the bird and the bird is migrating north in the spring and it can move that insect to another hemlock stand. And as well, human things like uh, movement of nursery stock and wood products is another way that, uh, you know, where the, the adelgid might be on those is getting moved to other places that are a lot further in many cases. So uh, what's the current situation in Ontario? And I apologize for these maps. These are the best I could find. They're from, uh, from some of CFIA's uh, products. And... Um, I'm I'm not sure people are aware. So there's two different types of uh, of regulations that this CFI uses. There's the ones called infested places, and the other ones called prohibit prohibish prohibition of movement. And um, if you look at the map and read the words there, these are the places where it's found. So Niagara Falls, Waynefleet, uh, Fort Erie, and there's others. There's other infestations in Pelham, Grafton, Hamilton, Holloman County, and Lincoln. So a couple of those are new last year uh, or last couple of years. So Grafton and Holloman uh, and Hamilton. So uh, you guys have been following this. Uh, you'll know about these things. So the the, the biggest uh, point I want to make with this is that uh, these, if you're in any of these areas, and you're thinking of doing forestry work in your woodland, you need to contact CFIA and make sure you know what the rules are around moving wood. Because um, I'm not 100% sure, but I know it's restricted. And I know you, in many cases, you need to have permission from them to actually move wood out of your, uh, out of your woodland. So that's an important point on this. Um, I guess the other point is that for now, it's mostly associated with this uh, this Niagara Peninsula area, with Grafton being the one furthest away from that sort of zone, and and maybe the most worrying. Uh, it's still quite a ways to where Eastern Ontario is, but uh, suffice to say, now's the time to uh, start getting ready. So um, that's the story there. Um, so. This is a, a diagram to try to help understand the biology of the species. I'm not going to get into a lot of the details, but I just want you to see that it's a very complicated uh, type of insect. Each one of these insects seems to have their own life cycle and their own way of doing business. But uh, as Bill has pointed out, one is uh, not a lonely number uh, with the Delgid, and that's because it's actually asexual reproduction. So they're all females. And they can all lay eggs. So uh, that, you know, is problematic just if you think of that on its own. But uh, a couple other things, no predators. It's And this is often the case with uh, invasive species, right? So they show up in an environment that they never evolved in historically, right? They're, they're not from there. So there's really no, uh, and a lot of times, not always, but there's, there's things that don't know that they could eat them and they haven't eaten them yet. So uh, really they have no predators. And the other thing is the, uh, the, the tree is also not used to the, what, what they do. So they did there, they have, they have defenses, but they don't, they're not used to this particular insect and how it operates. So that they're at a disadvantage there too. Right. Um, so if you look at the diagram, you can see maybe if we start around this time of year, which we're in right now, if we start in February, uh, we have adults at that point. Um, they lay eggs and they move to this. So lay eggs and uh, then they hatch and they become what they call crawlers in around, uh, you know, the end of March and into April and starting into May. Any of the crawler stages, those are the ones when it's most vulnerable to getting moved because they're, they're actually moving around so like a bird lands in april and may when they're migrating north and it gets on the bird then it can get transplanted trans uh 
transported by the bird to wherever it goes to next, right? So that's the worrying part there. Uh, so it, it turns into an adult by uh, June, lays eggs again, and, um, and then there's another crawler stage at the end of the summer. So this is kind of worrying. There's two time periods when uh, th this thing's moving around. The rest of the time is fairly uh, stay. Sta what do you want? Okay, it's not moving around. It sits in one place, so it stays stable at that point. But these numbers are uh, so they call this first stage here the progredians, gredians, and then the other stage is called the cystins. For those of you that are entomologists and like these terms, they're they're there for you. Uh, but huge numbers of eggs, and one egg has huge numbers of individuals. So it's it's scary here. And then we we've learned that ninety percent winter mortality can still maintain a stable population. So. Uh, yeah, so on the edge of where its habitat's moving, um, maybe you're losing 90% of them, but there's still a lot of them around. So that, I think this is a scary, scary diagram. Um, suffice to say, uh, it, it, once it's there, it can um, really start to expand quite quickly. Now, so how does this actually work? Like, what does it, what does the insect, so the insect um, is, is attacking the tree and and the tree's responding so there's both things going on so it's a let's just go through this a little bit so it's a sap feeding insect so you can see that this is a blown up picture i don't know how many times it's blown up but this long uh, piece that comes out here is what it's actually uh injecting into the into the base of the uh, needle so it's it's feeding on the needle um it's they're, they what they do is they they get stabilized there and they form this this woolly they call it an ovisac but it's a basically uh, this white material that you see in the diagram on the right the picture on the right and um, so th they once they're there they stay there they're feeding on the carbohydrates and the nutrients um, from the leaf and um, they basically sit there as I was showing in that other diagram for quite a long period of time just feeding on the uh, on the tree on the leaves and um how does but the, that's just what the insect's doing so the next thing is to talk about what what causes what how what happens to the tree and what what why does it why does it kill it right and and basically uh it's a couple it's two main things so the first one is that it's actually taking away carbohydrates and nutrients from the tree, wherever they are, whatever leaves they're on, they're degrading that part of the tree from being able to uh, function and it's causing decline in the tree. And then the second thing is that the, unfortunately, the, uh, I remember I was telling you that the, the trees do respond and they naturally respond to being attacked. But in this case, it's kind of a hype, they say it's, they call it hypersensitive. It does a whole bunch of things and they're, most of them are detrimental to its own health because uh, it it causes bud mortality, reduces shoot production, um, needles start to fall off and and turn brown, uh, the crown declines, uh, there's leaf area reduction, there, there's impaired uh, water transportation, and essentially, uh, once the insect's established, after about four four to fifteen years, you get ninety percent of the mortality. Um, what what they've noticed though in the U.S. there's this I don't know if you can see in this diagram but the, the there's whole hill sites where you know basically all the hemlock are dead except for the odd one so there are some that in this response this hypersensitive response are able to basically hold the insect off they do have a a resilience so there are some that are genetically adapted somehow to uh, being able to withstand the attack. So there's some hope that um, through, you know, genetics work that we could build a, a resilient uh, population over time. So that, that, that is a possibility with this, with this tree and this insect. So, you know, uh, how do we really 
get into you know today's in today's world what's the right way to uh to manage an insect like this and and because it's been in the US for so long you know they've really led the research on on um working towards an integrated pest management approach um and so these are the the four more four main areas and i've alluded to these a little bit in the discussion so far but the biocontrol the biological control part uh, is criti critical because the idea of that is to build up the predators that would naturally eat this in the forest that that they're from and or you know eat it i just say eat it in general but they would kill it somehow and um and that would you know begin to create a new ecosystem where their population would not be out of control it would be in check by these other uh these other predators. So that's a hope. Um, there's been some work done there. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, insecticides, uh, another area that's uh, quite a bit of work's been done on. And, um, you know, this comes at a time when you have the insect in your tree or in your forest, that the best approaches right now are to use some sort of insecticide that would stop that insect from doing more damage and allow the trees to continue to be healthy. And then the stand management part, they're using silviculture is something I want to talk to you about uh, with the rest of the presentation. But, uh, you know, there's it depends uh, at what stage you're at with the uh, with with the um, insect in your forest. So presumably the best time is before it's there. And that's what we're going to talk about a bit. But um, there's a few things that can be done in stand management after it's there. But a lot of times that's just a mitigation type of thing. We'll talk about that, and then I mentioned breeding. So there's there is the possibility of uh, of improving the genetics of hemlock to to uh, make it as in general a more resilient species to uh, to the um, adelgid. So let's talk about the insecticides for a minute, and I want to thank Glenn again. Glenn Prevo helped me with uh, with some of what the insecticides are that are being used. Um, and, and just to say that, uh, you know, the main purpose here is to protect the high value trees. So you think of your your parks, your your recreation areas, uh, you know, recreation properties, cottages and whatnot. Um, so you want to protect the trees that get infected. And the folks in the U.S. have had success with this. So they, they've found that and in some places they're really going hard on this like to be uh michigan's an example they they're in their protected areas where the insect is they're doing surveys they're finding the trees that have the adelgid in it and they're doing these injections and controlling the insect as best they can they're really trying to use this as a technique to hold the insect back so it's uh it and it seems to be working it takes a, quite a bit of money and it takes quite a bit of uh effort and diligence to make it work. Uh, it's really what most of us would feel is a short term or a medium term solution, you know, to try to give the hemlock the best chance they have in hopes that some of these biological controls and these other types of things will, will come into play. Um, the research shows that there are some minor incidental impacts to birds and insects but that's within the context of if you don't do anything and we lose our hemlock, there's a lot of birds and insects and other species that depend on hemlock and might not have it if we don't do something. So that's the story there. So here's your big table. On the left are the five insecticides that can be used uh, in Ontario currently. Um, You'll note triazine at the top, the same. Uh, I don't think it's the same formulation. I'm not 100% sure, but I, it could be. Uh, again, this isn't my expertise, but I wanted you to see the information. But triazine has been used with emerald ash borer. Um, and all of the first three uh, examples are, are injection types of uh, control methods. And you can see from the third column that some of them take a while to have their uh, full effect, but often the ones that take the longest 
to have their full effect, have a longer uh, lasting type of protection for up to four to seven years. Um, the cost column, I'm going to suggest our estimates right now. Uh, if you're going to get into this, uh, you need to talk to the people that are doing these types of things and find out what uh, what they're charging, I guess, is the bottom line. The last two are basal bark types of treatments. Right now, they're considered uh, emergency. They have emergency use registration, so you can use them uh, until this fall. And then I guess they'll make a new uh, decision on that. And I don't really have too much more to say on those, except that that is the most up-to-date information um, as of, you know, a month or so ago. Um, so the bio, I talked a little bit about the biological controls. Basically, uh, there's, there's beetles and there's some flies that have been uh, worked on. They come from um, the... Japan and the Pacific Northwest, where um, this insect is native, I understand. So there's a hemlock species in the West, and um, I gather this is native to there based on the information that I have. Anyway, these controls are being used in the U.S. They've released these insects, uh, the, the beetles and the flies into populations that are already infested with hemlock woolly adelgid and they're sort of watching this uh this this thing evolve uh they're pretty hopeful they seem to um you know they've, they've got the evidence that they they actually do consume or kill the uh the the adelgid so it's uh it's reassuring that way um of course when you move to a new country you have to start over again with uh with evaluating these things so uh, in Canada, there's active research uh, going on. Um, they're looking into all of these possibilities. And just last fall, uh, they released uh, one of the species, I believe a beetle, into the uh, infected areas in Nova Scotia. And they're, they're doing some monitoring on that now. So there's hope there. But what I really want to talk to you about is uh, this this opportunity, I think, is a way to, to describe it, to use uh, silviculture in um, potentially getting some of our forests in a better state uh, before the insects arrive. That's really the goal, I think. Um, but what is it about hemlock and adelgid that makes this possible? So uh, this, this table is intended to show you a little bit about that. So in the case of hemlock, uh, what's beneficial to it? Well, a optimal stand density um, allows you to get good growth and um, good growth usually um, comes with uh, healthy crowns and, and uh, a more healthy tree and a more resilient tree. So around 70% crown closure is where we tend to see that. Um, you don't want to go much below that. Uh, and you can go a bit above that because it's quite shade tolerant but um, that's about where you want to sit. Uh, so this live crown ratio, they want you want the tree to have, so this when you talk about live crown ratio, that means how much of the height of the tree is green, basically. So you measure down from the top, how far down do you actually have green? So if it's halfway down, that's a 50% live crown ratio. And we want to have trees that have a, uh, you know, around that or more, if possible. Uh, anything below 30% is a suppressed tree and one that can't respond very well to uh, increased resources by thinning, like more light or more uh, nutrients, water, et cetera. They just don't have enough of a factory to be able to respond to it. So greater than 50% live crown. Uh, continuous supply of soil moisture is helpful. Cool music topographic positions, deep fertile loamy soils. These are all the ideal things that you'd want to have if you're trying to grow the absolute best of hemlock trees out there. Sometimes those are, are things you can't change, but uh, um, that's the story on that. So what about the adelgid though? What do they tend to like? Well, they like uh, high uh, leaf nitrogen. There's something. Uh, the other thing they like is cool shaded crown positions. So they like to be 
where that you know you think of those deep dark forests well that's where they like to be they like to be in the shade that we want less than 30 percent sunlight uh warm minimum winter temperature so we talked about that that they can be affected by cold in the winter and a cooler maximum summer temperatures so this all sort of leads towards hey we could do something in these forests we could maybe thin them and create these conditions that would be better for hemlock growth and bad for adelgid health in terms of uh, being on bright sunny branches. So in the in the guide, the uh, the fact sheet, uh, we built this we built this table that uh, basically shows how you might be able to uh, respond to hemlock uh, woolly adelgid uh, infestations at the different stages. So across the top. There's first stage is it's not there at all. The second stage is there's a low abundance uh, in isolated populations. The third stage is that it's widely established. And, and the last stage is that it's endemic. It's, 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 it's everywhere, right? So um, really uh, with the opportunity to do some management, that, that, first, uh, that first stage is quite important. Um, where the, the hemlock uh, adelgid is not there. And in those conditions, uh, we're recommending that some sort of density management should occur. And, and what we think would be best is to try to reduce competition and improve the, uh, the growth and, and ultimately the resilience of, uh, of these hemlocks. So uh, we want to get rid of the damaged or suppressed trees. So those trees with less than 30% live crown ratio should probably go. The ones that are underneath, they don't have a very, very big crown on them. They're, they're not going to be able to respond to a thinning. Uh, we want to retain the other species and, and the healthy hemlock um, because they're, they may be needed uh, in the case where the hemlock gets damaged, right? So uh, and in the understory, we want to protect hemlock and the other evergreen um, regeneration. As you move to the right, you start talking about the next stage, uh, the, the hemlock adelgid is there, in which case damaged or infested trees should be removed. Uh, the ones that if you could possibly treat them, that would be the time to treat them as soon as it starts getting into your stand. Um, you got you want to retain evergreen cover and you want to protect the understory hemlock and other conifers. Um, across the bottom, you're going to notice this this phrase: avoid preemptive salvage harvest of healthy hemlock. And this is a big caution across the board here until you get into the, the very end stage. Remember, we don't know which ones are resilient or have that potential a genetic adaptation to being resilient to it. So we don't want to preemptively remove those trees by accident because we don't know which ones they are. So it's better to work with the trees that are there, keep the healthy ones and remove the poor, poorer ones. I'm not going to go through too much more of this, uh, this uh, diagram because uh, we're not really there yet, but you can read how that would work um, if there was more Adelgid in your stand. And the last thing to comment about this, this thinning, remember we're doing two things. We're trying to make it good for the hemlock and bad for the adelgid. And apparently they don't like a lot of sunlight on the branches. So we do need to open these stands a bit, but not too much. 70% crown closure is sort of the target. So tell me something good. <laughs> what is on the horizon? So uh, in Nova Scotia, uh, they've got a couple of trials going. They're looking at using selection and uh, uniform shelterwood and focusing on these very ideas that we're talking about here with their with their management. So they've got a couple of trials. They don't have any results yet. They're pretty new. Um, and they're looking at removing 20% of the BA in the selection and 40% in the uh, shelterwood. Uh, we need something like this in Ontario. We would be very, it would be very beneficial to... Um, <clears throat> have some trials in place to see how <clears throat> hemlock responds. And unfortunately also to see how uh, resilient they are when the, when the uh, adelgid gets there, if it gets there. 
So we don't have any yet. There's been some discussion. Um, there's information coming out, as I mentioned, the, Hem the Chronicle article last summer, the uh, the um, tech note, the fact sheet that I've was just been talking about, it came out last fall. It's on the, um, the Invasive Species Center webpage, and they have this management guide they're working on there as well. Um, and Martin mentioned it, we're going to start doing some field training for civil culture, um, thinking about these ideas. We're doing a, uh, the first one in April in Ottawa, and it's all for practitioners and it's already fully subscribed. So, uh, but stay tuned, we will probably be doing more of this. And then, like I said, research by uh, the Ontario scientists, the, the federal scientists, uh, is occurring and has been occurring on early detection, range expansion, bio, bio controls, and uh, looking at civil culture. So we're hopeful that we'll get some more information from the experts, the real experts. <laughs> uh, here's your list of uh, the, the articles that I keep referring to. Um, I'll leave that up for a minute. Um, the long titles, but... Uh, there's good, there's good information in there, and uh, a lot of the explanation behind the science is in that Chronicle article. So uh, if you're really into the details, that's a good place to go. I'm going to go to my next slide and say thank you, and uh, I'm up for questions. Uh, you can see all my co-conspirators here at the bottom. Thanks to all of them. Uh, as, I, as I've said, it's, it is a team. It's a team approach. Um, we're building the expertise every day. <laughs> it's not there yet, but uh, we just have to keep going ahead and uh, doing our best, right? So I guess my biggest point is if you've been watching some hemlock in your forest and wondering whether there's anything you can do, I think the point is now's the time to consider doing some thinning in there, some nice light thinning, getting out the, those those trees that aren't really contributing and trying to make it better for the bigger trees, the trees with a nice crown on them. And they'll, you know, they'll be able to expand. Uh, there's a study out of um, out of the U.S. by a woman named, uh, she's from the Forest Service, Mary Ann Fajvan, F-A-J-V-A-N. She's uh, put out a 10-year, she did a, a study that she started more than 10 years ago and it proved that hemlock will respond to this uh, type of thinning. They will, they will, uh, they will expand their crowns. Uh, they'll maintain their live crown ratio. If you don't do it, the trees tend to lose some of that live crown ratio. So uh, there's some, there's some evidence that that supports this. That's good for me. Any questions? Thanks so much, Ken. We really, really appreciate you uh, taking the time to to compile all this information and uh, chat with us today. Um, Hemlock Willie Adelgid really is such a new but uh, very well, very real threat to hemlock stands, as you you've clearly demonstrated here. But um, what you said really stood out to me. I think before even though the webinar got going, just that. Uh, when you put when multiple people put their heads together, um, working on one problem, hopefully we can we can find some 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 solutions. Um, so before we dive into the Q and A, I'll just give folks a moment to put their questions in the chat. Um, I'll just I'll attempt to, to share my screen here, um, and this won't be a surprise to Ken as he was here last year for the the Winter Woodlock Conference, but. Um, we have a small token of appreciation for you, Ken, the hidden life of trees. Uh, so we hope that uh, that you enjoy reading it just as much as Around the World in 80 Trees. Yep, I'm almost finished with Around the World. I'm really Great. enjoying it. Great, yeah. excellent. Well, hopefully it'll get to you in time then. All right. Um, excellent. Um, so I'm just gonna put up our sponsors again as we get into the Q&A. Um, just pop this open here, just so you're aware, Ken, as well. It'll just be you and I for the Q&A session. Um, okay. Anything with uh, anything more technical or pesticides that uh, we can't answer today, we can always uh, refer to some other folks All right. to get this one answered. Okay. Okay, so I'll just dive in here. 
Um, I'll start with the shortest question. Um, why is this bug, so the adelgid, only with hemlock? Why is it only with hemlock? So I, I suppose why is it only associated with hemlock? Well, it's it's yeah. I mean, it's like a lot of things. There, it's a very you know, it's it it's that's where it evolved. It evolved with uh, another type of hemlock that grows in in uh, in Asia, and I I believe in the Northwest too. I'm not, which doesn't quite make sense to me, but I'm not sure if if it if it just started there more historically than here. But uh, yeah, a lot of times you get it. Uh, you know, species of insects and uh, are often very, you know, specific on their host. And uh, so it's just happens to be one of those ones that's, uh, you know, co-evolved historically with that species. And uh, it's got all the, I guess it's perfect for it. And, it. and other species maybe just aren't suited to it, I gather. I mean, it's, it's not unusual. There are other insects like that that are adapted to one species. Yeah, you got some um, coevolution going on as well there as well, um, in addition to that. Um, another question here, um, what would be the criteria for an operational trial? What would be the, oh, that's a good question. Uh, the criteria would be, uh, well, you need to have a pretty, uh, like a, probably at least 40 percent i'm just this is off the top of my head like we'd have to talk some more but i mean 40 percent hemlock uh it should be in a mature stand and um you know like for this we're trying to look at how how the hemlock responds to the thinnings right because uh, unfortunately you can't test the the insect part of it until it gets there and you, you don't really even want it to get there so it's uh it's one of those things where uh you know, it needs to be big enough that you can get some data from it. So, you know, maybe 10 acres sort of minimum and 40, 30, 40% hemlock and, you know, be able to do some of these types of techniques in it, these thinning types of techniques to, to look at it. But yeah, any kind of risk, uh, I think we're interested in tracking what people are doing. So if people do try some of these things, um, and I don't know who's going to be the repository for this kind of information, but uh, we might have to think of that. But we want to know what people are finding in terms of the hemlock responding to to thinning. And if it does, the insect gets there, that'd be the next question. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, how long... Um... Got a couple more questions coming in. Um, I'm not sure in your research, Ken, whether it would have come up if there is a, predict a predicted northern limit of spread of HWA based on current winter temperatures. Yeah, not off the top of my head. There was a, yeah, there's a number, a winter sort of, thinking minus eight celsius something like that but i don't know for sure but yeah there is a there are some temperatures that have been thrown out and uh we did try drawing a uh a, a line on our maps i guess uh to show where it looked like and we we're going to use that in some of our uh reporting but i'm not sure if we did it was you know, it was it was somewhere. It, it, you could almost say the Great Lakes St. Lawrence uh, line was sort of where it seemed to be as far as it could go right now. And that that was our hope is that you know that climate could control it, but we just can't trust the climate right now because it keeps getting warmer, right? So, but yeah, I think the feeling was that I will say somewhere around the uh, Great Lakes St. Lawrence uh, boundary line which I suppose may have to change too. But anyway, for now, that's uh, that's about where, where it seemed to be stopping. It was too cold after that for it. I think where on the tree? Sorry, Ken, you're saying? No, that's my answer for that. Thank you. Okay, great, great. 
Um, another one in here, um, where on the tree are we likely to see the insect? Um, on the top, could it be all over the tree? Um, this individual has a lot of large hemlock on their lot. Yeah, what they say is that it's often up high in the crown initially when it first, they, it seems that, again, not 100% sure, but I think a lot of times they're getting there with birds. So the bird lands somewhere higher in the crown, probably, not always, but because uh, um, these are, you know, they're they're pretty dense for us. So a lot of times I think the birds are coming in from the top and so they land there. And I guess that's probably where the, the adelgia gets established initially. But they can, after it's been there for a while, they, they move down through the crown. They come down lower in the trees. That's how I understand it. That a problem, like a lot of these things, is the detection early is tricky because they're basically invisible because it's this, this forest that we just talked about that you can't really see through. And they're up there, right? So I didn't get into it. There's some of these detection techniques that involve shooting, uh, they're like tennis balls, up into the the crown of the tree to try to get the um the the woolly part of the the the, the delgate on it and come and have it come back down or clipping branches that are higher up in the tree so there's a few other th these uh so you can go on the internet and check about uh the the techniques for doing the monitoring the cfs has had quite a bit of work on that and they've got some pretty neat uh, methods for uh for doing that uh, but yeah, it's another one where sometimes you don't find out until it's been there for a while because it's sort of elusive and it's probably in the top of the tree to start, unfortunately. Um, so I've got a comment to preserve the hemlock canopy until biocontrols are available slash established. Um, and then number two that they added, um, silviculture won't be effective in areas with an infestation. It can help in areas that are 10 years away from infestation, um, as it would give the trees time to do all the things you mentioned in the presentation. Um, anything to add to that, or we can move on to another question if you'd like. No, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. I've, I've heard of this idea. Um, so yeah, I gather the point is that uh, the insecticide's gonna help that tree uh, if the insect gets there, like even before it's there, I think is what they're saying. So preemptively, uh, again, I, sorry, go ahead. It's um, it's hard as well when uh, with the when you're not having a live discussion, having these types of uh, comments mm -hmm. and discussion, it can be hard to keep track yeah. of meeting in one month. But thank you, thank you for adding that. I'm 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 still learning about all these things. So yeah, that that's. Uh, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, I think I'll take maybe one more question and then perhaps we can, one or two more questions. We still have five minutes here. Right. Uh, something else I'll add about the pesticide as well is that um, the Ontario Woodlot Association is hoping to include a webinar in the future going over some of the specifics of pesticide related to HWA and hopefully that's something that'll be in the works in the springtime. Nice. Um, there's another question here as well that I think a lot of people will find um, relevant is how long can HWA survive on the log and or off the needles? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. It's a very particular one. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, related to silviculture, uh, what time of year would be the best time to thin? What time of year would be the best time to thin would be when it's the, it, and I'm guessing they're saying related to the insect, right? So, so you want to avoid that because uh, you don't, it might be in your stand, right? You don't know. So you maybe want to avoid that stage when it's a crawler because, uh, well, actually I shouldn't even say that. I think you're going to look at the site. If there's no, I think it's about whether the insect's there or not. So if it's not there, and your shirt's not there, then you want to do it at the best time for that site. And a lot of times these are in often in damp, wetter areas. So we want to avoid the uh, the time when they're most vulnerable, which is the spring and anytime it's wet. So spring, fall, summer, 
So I would say you want to stick to the winner. Like a lot of our operations, the winner is probably the best. And, uh, but there's still going to, if, if, you know, if it is in an infested area, then the, 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 uh, the diligence on branches and else other parts of the tree. Right. So, yeah, I think winter would be best. Yeah. Thanks, Ken. And then I think there's uh, one more question I'd like to add in here. Cause I think it's, it's an important one for everybody. Um, if you have an expected infection, can we have someone visit us for on-site education? Can someone come? Uh, I don't, I don't have the answer. Like I, I don't have the answer to that. Like I know the CFIA, if, if they, if there's an infection, they want to know about it. So yes, if you, if you have, if you think there's an infection or there's one nearby, uh, I think you want to call them first, CFIA and, and advise them that you're worried about that. I, I, they do want to know about every incident of this insect right now. They're, they're, uh, diligent about that from what I understand. So, uh, I think you do want to contact them and they would be the experts in terms of how to detect it. They've got staff that are well-trained. They've been doing this for quite a while now. So uh, they're, they're the experts really. Um, otherwise, uh, I think that's the, the question, right? That- Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, 100%. I think CFIA um, is the group to go to. Um, I don't have the information in front of me right now, but what we will do is send out an email with the reporting to all people who've registered. Um, and in that email, we'll include information for how to send a suspected case to CFIA. Um, they'll want some information and some pictures. Um, and if they suspect that it could be a case, at, at that point, they'll they'll run their own um, investigation and contact. Um, right. So <clears throat> I think we're just about out of time for uh, questions. I just have a couple other things I'd like to say. And I know... Um, John would like to share something as well. Uh, but just while John gets that queued up, um, I'd once again like to thank our sponsors, the committee members, speakers like Ken, um, and the membership of Ontario Woodlot Association and Eastern Ontario Model Forest. If you aren't a member of OWA and EOMF and enjoy tuning into the Kenville Winter Woodlot podcast,